In addition to speaking here today, we're speaking to Facebook and to Twitter and to a number of other social media outlets that will probably at some point in time try to ban us from being there because something about the truth they're not real crazy about. And I have, quite by accident, um, kind of decided on a text that I would um, not normally have chosen. But I chose it for a reason. Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it, with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. And the seven angels, which had seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you give us. Now, Lord, we ask that you would literally rend the heavens and come down. Fill this place, fill this, this message with your glory. That it doesn't raise us up or glorify us, but that it glorifies you and that it touches the hearts of people, that they might understand who we are, where we are, and the judgment that, that is surely coming upon America unless we change. Father, to that end, we commit ourselves individually, corporately, collectively. But Lord, we understand that if revival is to come, it starts here with me. Father, we ask in your name that you would give us the wisdom and the courage to seek revival, to follow hard after you. That we might be changed, renewed, revived, that we might be completely different than we've ever been before in this time of desperate need. In Yeshua's name, amen. I, I believe, and I, I think I said this last week, there has been a, um, a spirit of rage, of murder, of, of violence, of, of, of arson, of overthrow that has been unleashed upon the earth. I believe I can even tell you when it happened. It was about five years ago that it happened. It was a spirit of rebellion that had been brewing for some time. And certain people of evil exploited that. And in their wickedness, just as the psalm you read, in their wickedness they have released that that awesome power upon the earth. As we move toward the, the last days, the last times we, we can expect this, we know this, yet it's still sad because it's not, it's not an, an enemy from without that's coming after us. It's the enemy within. Just, just like in Psalm 55, it's the enemy that, that's here, that we know, someone that we, we thought was our friend, someone that, that we have fellowship with from our own Congress, from our own White House, from people that have taken a, a pledge and an oath to serve their country, to protect rights like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, how do you have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if you destroy everything around you, if you destroy your nation, if you destroy those things which made us great, if you destroy that very thing which made us an exceptional people? You look at Numbers 16, the sins of Korah. What was Korah's problem? Korah wanted power. So he comes to Moses and he says, well, Moses, why in the world should we be under Aaron? We're the Levites. You've got no, you've got no rule over us. God set us apart. Moses said, okay, I'll make you a deal. You go ahead and fill your censers with incense, and we'll come back here tomorrow and see who God chooses. God burnt him and 249 of his compatriots up. Korah was gone, along with his whole group. But that wasn't the end of it. 
the haughty, the proud, the rebellious said, hey, Moses, we got a bone to pick with you. You just killed 250 of our guys. Remember, the guys that came there were the men of renown, it says. These were the big shots in, big shots in, in Israel or in, among the Hebrew people. And God said, I don't play that game. I've already shown you my power. These 250 are gone, and the plague started rolling through the Hebrew people. And had Moses, who had just been attacked by, by Korah and now by the congregation, had he not had greater love, had he not had greater love than his anger at what had happened, Israel would have died. But he sent Aaron to stand in the gap for the people so that they'd live. Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 18. And then we find Abraham bargaining with God. God, if we can find this many, will you, will you spare it? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. If you'll find this many, I'll spare it. If I find just this many, will you spare it? How about just this many, will you spare it? He got down to just a few and then realized that this was an us four and no more situation. But he stood in the gap, even for wicked Sodom and Gomorrah. And despite the, uh, the left's attempts to ameliorate the situation, the sexual sin that God condemned, he still condemned. There is no point in history that God is not involved. None. The Bible records and history verifies that the tribe known as the Assyrians were the worst enemies of Israel ever. They slaughtered the Israelites at every possible turn. Every time they got a chance, they were killing Israel. They were warlike people. And by the way, very cruel people. They didn't just kill you. They, they wanted to massacre you. They wanted to torture you. They wanted, to, they wanted to make a lesson out of you so that any other group of people they faced would say, just bow the knee to them. These are vicious, vicious people. But the Assyrian Empire, like all empires, came and went. And it was crushed by a, a king who uh, stationed an army in their fortresses and two armies around their sides, and they lost. The Assyrians were beaten. They retreated to Assyria. The Babylonians allied with the Medes, the Persians, the Scythians. And in 612, mighty, mighty, mighty Assyria fell. And guess where they fell, by the way? Nineveh. That should ring a bell to people that read a little scripture. They fell at Nineveh, where a guy by the name of Jonah had been sent and called them to repentance. And they repented, but only for a while. And wicked Nineveh, with all their false gods, and wicked Assyrians, with all of their brutality, they, they lost. They were defeated. But they weren't defeated by somebody who was better or godly. They were simply punished by somebody more ungodly than they were, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians. And by the way, it was a decisive victory for the Babylonians, essentially. The Assyrians ran. From there, the Assyrians went to the southern edge of the Black Sea until things got too hot there. The Babylonians chased them out of there eventually, too. And they went to the north shore of the Black Sea. And in fact, Greek historians found so many Assyrians there that they called that, that northern area of the Black Sea, they called it Assyria. So that people still existed. But eventually, it became hot there, too. And they were on the run. So they crossed the Caucasus Mountains, went north of the Black Sea, crossed the Caucasus Mountains, and came down into northern Europe. And in northern Europe, they settled into a country that was treed and had mountains and had valleys, and it was beautiful. And we now today call it Germany. And isn't it interesting, the worst enemy of God's people travels over the Caucasus Mountains, which means the White Mountains. They travel over the Caucasus Mountains, and by the way, a people 
that were unusual because they had unusually light skin color compared to the, the rest of the Semitic tribe, they cross over into Europe and settle into Germany. And they bring their gods with them. Somewhere around the first century, they built a city there. And that city, by the way, is still, still has a plaque saying that the Assyrians built this city. And they still use it as a, use it as a tourist attraction. So this is not make-believe. This is not lore or legend. This is real history. The Greeks have recorded it. The Romans have recorded it. It is well-established history. These became the Germanic tribes. The Germanic tribes became Germany. Is it any wonder then that the German people hated the Jews? You see, nations have demons that drive them. You can look at you can look at white America. White America has demons that drive them: the greed, power, self-indulgence. You can look at other countries, and you can determine by their lifestyles, you can determine what demons are that, that drive them. And the nations are all driven. How do we know? Ephesians chapter 6. For we struggle not with flesh and blood, but with, with principalities and powers and spiritual forces of evil in dark places and heavenly places. There is a kingdom set up, and, and they have fiefdoms. And they have controlling demonic spirits. And in 1290, you go back a bit in history, 1290, as we said last week, England threw the Jews out of England. Most of them were Messianic Jews, by the way, that they wanted to clean them out. Because remember, there's a great struggle going on still even in the, in the 1200s between the Roman church and the, the Jerusalem church. Now, Constantine in 320 has established the Roman church. He got together with Pope Sylvester and said, listen, guy, the last seven popes before you have been martyred. You don't want to be number eight. He said, I have a sun-worshiping empire. So we're going to go from the Sabbath to Sunday. You tell the, you tell the Christian folks that it's the Son of God day, S-O-N day. And I'll tell the, the, the pagans that it's S-U-N day, and we'll both be happy. And we can call ourselves a Christian empire. So that's what they did. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and he also found out that all the Jews were being expelled from Portugal and Spain. And the Spanish Inquisition was on, personally run by Ferdinand and Isabella. So an Italian Jew goes to the biggest Jew on the, on the continent and gets money to go to what we now consider America to bring back treasures to them but in his heart, in his diary, he writes, because I'm trying to find a place where God's people can come and worship. So isn't it interesting that in 1492, Columbus sails. In 1942, Hitler orders the extermination of all of the Jews. Six million were, were killed, perhaps even more. Somewhere between six and eight million were slaughtered, massacred. But, you know, e even, even in this tra tragedy, and we look at it and we say, how could God allow it? Because God's hand was still in it. Because after World War II, what happened? God showed his hand again. What happened in 1948? May 1948, the, the Jewish state, the, the Israel was established. Why? Because the world felt guilty. We had a guilt complex. So we said, we've got to do something for these Jews. Now, England had a problem. They were very anti-Semitic. In fact, if you recall, the slogan back then was, we have to do something about these, quote, damn Jews, end quote. That's how they viewed them, as damnable people. So here's what England did. They looked, and by the way, in World War II, England forbid Jews from landing in the Middle East, in the Palestine area. Hundreds of thousands died as a result of the fact that England would not let them come to the Middle East. So what does England do after World War II? They decide they're going to plop these Jews right down in the middle of all of these Mohammedans. 
And they figure the Mohammedans are going to take care of the problem for us. So we'll no longer have a Jewish problem. Well, God had other plans. David Ben-Gurion, head of the Jewish agency, announced the establishment of the, of the state of Israel, and guess what? They were attacked immediately. Now, by the way, to give you an idea of the size of Israel, if you took a football field, 100 yards long, wide, and you take a normal house brick, and you cut it in half, and you set it on the 50-yard line, that's the size of Israel compared to all of the Islamic nations around them. So England plops them down in the middle of this hurricane, figuring that they would be taken care of and the problem would be over. Because they did, quote, the right thing, right? But it didn't happen that way. Israel not only survived, they thrived. <laughs> Later on, there's going to be a treaty. We, we read about it in Scripture. And at three and a half years, that treaty is broken. But the treaty is, is brokered by Europe between the Arabs and, and Israel. And a lot, of, a lot of Bible scholars have said, well, they did that to save Israel. It was God's hand saving Israel. I think it's just the opposite. I think Israel was so strong that they did it to intervene to save the Arab nations around them. Because God's power is not going to be shunted. And that's why the treaty is broken after three and a half years, because they betray Israel, who stopped the war and saved the Arab nations. But that's another sermon. So even in this slaughter, we see the same thing. You see God's hand in history. You see God's hand in history of America. Two ships set sail for America, only one landed. And the one that landed was the Mayflower. And the only people on board were Christians. 66% were Sabbath-keeping Christians. 33% were Puritans, many of whom, whose families had died for their faith, many who had already been imprisoned and tortured for their faith. It's an odd text to read, isn't it? Revelation chapter 8. But the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it unto the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And if you look under the blood altar, when the Lord opens the blood altar and he asks, how are you? And they all said, how long, O Lord, holy and true, till you avenge our death, till you, till you stop what's going on? And the Lord said, rest a little while longer. There's some more of your brothers and sisters that are going to join you here. And he gave them all white robes and told them to rest. And the prayers of the saints went up as a sweet-smelling incense before God. And the angel mixed it on the golden censer, and he dumped it on the earth. And what happened? Fire and thunder and voices and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, I mention that for one reason, the power of prayer. You see what happened here? The prayers of the saints went up, and God looked at it, and he said, he told the angel, mix it with incense, bring it before me, now cast it to the earth. And all of those things that the saints had been praying for, for protection, suddenly there were fires, lightnings, thunderings, and an earthquake. We are not a weak defeated people. We are a people of power. Our prayers mean something. We don't just shoot these things up in the air and hope God catches one once in a while. The prayers of the saints filled the throne room, and he put them in the golden censer with the incense, and he mixed it with fire from the altar. And what fire was that? The fire of righteousness. And it was cast down to the earth. And why was there thunder and lightning and all of this stuff happening? Because what, what fellowship had light with darkness? They were polar opposites. And when that righteousness hit this unholiness, sparks flew. But Israel didn't die. 
Look at Numbers 32. That's when the, 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 the Israelites sent the spies in, and they said, go spy out the land. Tell us what this land is like. And what happened? They all came back safe too with a bad report. But as you read that, there's a curious point in there. As it goes through the 12 tribes, Dan is not there. Dan was the idolatrous of the 12 tribes. Dan is excluded from Numbers 32. Manasseh is there. Well, who is Manasseh? Manasseh is the son of Joseph, the tribe from Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. And what did they represent? The Gentile nations. He had a Gentile wife from whom he had Gentile children. Remember, it was the mother's lineage that marked the children of Israel. These were Gentile children being brought into what? Israel. Revelation 7. And after these things, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God. And I heard a number of them that were sealed. And then it goes through the tribes. And guess which tribe is missing again from the 144,000? Dan is excluded. Who's there? Ephraim and Manasseh. Why? Well, because there's another prophecy. These were the Gentile sons of Joseph. We have a tendency to look at, at promise. And we have a tendency to look at the holy days and the Sabbaths and say, well, that's... Israel's Sabbath. That's not the church's Sabbath. That's Israel's Sabbath. What does God say? He says, the Sabbath is my Sabbath. And what does he say of himself? I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. By the way, that the, the Sabbath, breaking of the Sabbath, violation of the Sabbath, carried with it what? The death penalty. Yahweh was serious about his Sabbaths. The same penalty for murder, the same penalty for adultery. So he was serious about his Sabbaths. He said, my Sabbaths are forever. Genesis 45, 48, 5. And now the two sons of Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Just like the other tribes, these, these sons are going to be my sons, Jacob slash Israel says. And thy issue, which thou hast begettest after them, shall be mine, uh, shall be thine, and they shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. So here's old Jacob. He's getting ready to, he's getting ready to go to meet God. But he wants to bless Joseph's sons, his Gentile sons, before he goes. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. And Israel stretched out his hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was, at the, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all of my life long until this day. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make these as Ephraim and as Manasseh, and he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your forefathers. Moreover, I have given thee one portion above thy brethren. One portion above thy brethren with your Gentile children. You're getting an extra portion. 
which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. So Israel blessed the two sons of Joseph. And now we see the next prophecy, the prophecy of the twin twigs. Ezekiel 37, 15, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, for all the house of Israel and his companions. You notice he says Ephraim in the house of Israel and their companions, the rest of the tribes. But he mentions them specifically in the, this twin twig prophecy. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by thee? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put with them, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be in mine hand. So God brings in one fell swoop nations that don't even exist yet into the house of Israel. House of Judah, the house of Israel, and now he says they're going to become one. Why? Because the Gentile nations are being folded in, Ephraim and Manasseh are being folded into Israel. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen where they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation. One nation. That's the prophecy. That I am going to make the two one. Paul says in Ephesians 2, Wherefore, remember that being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the word, in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, have been made nigh with the blood of Christ, for he is our peace who hath made both one Israel and Judah, the Gentile nations being folded into Israel. Is it a replacement theology? No. It's an inclusion theology. God didn't do away with Israel. He didn't do away with Judah. He simply folded Ephraim and Manasseh, that's the Gentile nations, into the house of Israel. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity of the law of commandments contained in ordinance to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. By the way, notice that he didn't say he did away with the law. He said, I did away with the ordinances of the law that accused you, that, that condemned you. Because law is eternal. How do we know? Because John tells us, in the beginning was the word, and it's the word logos. It means the revealed righteousness of God. In the beginning was the law word, and the law word was with God, and the law word was God, and the law word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when you throw out the law, what are you throwing out? Throwing out the Messiah. You have thrown out Messiah when you throw out law. That's why Paul says that, that the law is a tutor which brings us to the Messiah. Why? Because he was the law word in the flesh. And what is he? He is the doorway that takes us to the Father, that we might have that fellowship. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity of the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and unto them that were nigh. And through him we both have access to one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. Isn't that amazing? There, there is no more Jew nor Greek, free nor slave. There is one people, the people of God. God recognizes no color. 
He recognized no eth ethnicity. He recognizes only the blood of the Messiah and its covering for us. That is justification. The question now is sanctification. How then shall we live? How shall we respond, as Peter says, to such great soteria, or salvation, such great deliverance? See, folks, this is, this is important because it tells us who we are in God. It tells us who we are in Yahweh. We, we don't have to settle for second-class citizenship as either Jews or Gentiles because we are now Israel and Judah and we are one household. So who are we in Messiah? Well, it's interesting. Jeremiah tells us way, way back in Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah is a harsh prophet. I mean, when you read Jeremiah 50 and 51, that's some scary stuff. He's talking about end-time Babylon. And what happens to end-time Babylon is it's scary. Particularly if you begin to identify who end-time Babylon might be. But Jeremiah 23, verse 6, he says, In the days of Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called. Who shall be called? Messiah. The Lord, our righteousness. And it's all in caps in the Hebrew. Every bit of it's in caps. The Lord, our righteousness. Now go to Jeremiah 33. This is the bride. And those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Same term, small letters except for Lord. Why? Because we, the bride, have taken the last name of whom? The husband. The Lord, our righteousness, the husband. Small, the Lord, our righteousness. In Jeremiah 33, because we are the bride. Now, there's another description of the bride in Revelation. I won't go into that now, but it is the righteousness of the saints that adorns the bride. So we have the right to pray. Why? Because we're going to our Messiah, our husband. And when we go, we, we have sway. Why? Because he's our Messiah. He intercedes for us. He became our propitiation, our eternal blood covering for all of the sins of mankind. And he, he, he is our intercessor before the Father day and night. We used to have an accuser day and night. But now we have an intercessor day and night. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. As I said, we have a tremendous, violent spirit that is engulfing this nation. Look at Seattle. We have a whole new nation, CHOP. CHOP is born. CHOP, what a name for it. Nonetheless, we have a new nation birthed within our nation, CHOP. The officials they are doing, they are agreeing with it. They have taken this anarchy, they have taken this treasonous act and said, we agree with it, keeping the police out of here. And not only that, officials all over the country are saying we need to defund the police departments. Why? Because it stands for order and law and right. But do they really want to defund? No. What do they want to do? Same thing Hitler did, brown shirts. If we put in the brown shirts, we can do whatever we want, to whomever we want, whenever we want because we've got to pass. What is it about? It is about rebellion. It is about exactly where Korah was. I want to be in charge here. I want to be the boss. Listen, no faction ever takes power with a plan to give it back, ever. This is an unholy power grab. And we have idiot politicians who are so blind so feeble-minded that, just like in, the, in the, the psalm you read, they talk about the things of God and then they do evil. They talk about blessing you while they're stabbing you in the back. And I could go through the list of politicians who were involved. But I won't. We pretty much know who they are. 
For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. When you've got these, when you've got these political prostitutes that, that pander and pretend that they're talking to God, praying for, for the nation and praying for the president, and they're unrighteous in every way. Listen, you cannot be pro-abortion and pro-Christian at the same time. You simply cannot be because the Lord says to the king of Israel, because you have polluted Jerusalem with innocent blood, even if you grab the horns of the altar, which by the way was, was made you scot-free, he said, even if you grab the horns of the altar, I'll rip you from it and destroy you myself. Why? Because you have shed innocent blood. So we have all of these politicians now pandering telling us they're praying for the nation and praying for the president while they're slaughtering the innocent. Their hands are dripping with blood as they lift him up to a holy God. How do you think he's going to respond? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayers of the upright is, are his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth them that follow after righteousness. Mark. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. There's a lot more to that, to having what you, what you pray for. There's a lot of qualifications in that. Now, again, that's another sermon. We won't go into it today. But the important thing is here, he says, if you want to be heard, what do you have to do? Forgive. Forgive. So if you stand with hatred in your heart towards someone, by the way, can you, can, you still, can you still hate an evil politician? Yeah, you can hate exactly everything they stand for and everything they do. Yes. Do you still have to love them? Yeah, yeah. That's the hard part, isn't it? The hard part is knowing how filthy and, and degraded they are until, until we look back at our lives and we see how filthy and degraded we were and God loved us anyway. But well, that doesn't mean we don't pray with the psalmist, break the teeth of my enemy, O Lord. That is my favorite prayer, by the way. I'm waiting to see some toothless politicians. We, we keep praying. John 17, 15, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them, I have given them the word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Messiah is telling them, listen, Father, here's what I've done. I've given them your word. They're going to be hated. So if your church isn't hated, you probably ought to sit down and figure out why. If you as a Christian are not stepping on some toes, if you're not offending some people, you, you kind of need to ask why. There's a reason. There's a reason. I must be okay because I... I find that I offend just about everybody. <laughs> so I must I must be a saint. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. For they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. <clears throat> as thou hast sent me into the world, even so, I have also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that I might also be sanctified through the truth. And neither pray I thee alone, for thee alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their words. So he's praying in the future. Everybody's lives they touch, I'm praying for them. But what's the qualification here? If you want to be heard, he says, here's the deal. If you want power with God, you have to live a sanctified life. Messiah did what he did on the cross. That is complete, it's final, it is salvation. The question is now, how then shall we live? Francis Schaeffer. How do we respond to that salvation? How are you going to live your life? <clears throat> Unfortunately, the world, the world has become very, very comfortable in the church. And that's scary. What's even scarier is the church has become very, very comfortable in the world. They say we should have no borders, but I believe in borders. 
You see, that southern border is the gateway for drugs and violence and gangs and MS-13 and every vile thing under the sun. We have about 150 people a week die from drug overdoses. And guess where it comes from? 90% comes from that southern border. We don't believe in borders, though. Unfortunately, the church doesn't believe in borders either. We have let down the borders. We no longer preach the blood. We no longer preach hellfire. We no longer preach eternity. So as a result, you can live like hell and hope to attain to heaven, according to the church. God disagrees. John says, here's how you know if you love God. You keep his commandments and they are not grievous to you. So we're faced with a choice. We have salvation, free and clear. As I said last week, Messiah died for the sins of the whole world, but if you were the only one here on this planet, if there was no one else, he still would have come for you. Just for you. That's how important you are. Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Father says, listen, you want to you get to me? Come to the Son. I have given you salvation. I have given you, I have given you what you need. Now, how will you respond? Our prayers can and will change things, and the church has lost that understanding. You go to, to so many churches, and, and they have these kind of rote prayers that they go through. But they don't mean anything. They're just spewing out words. Go now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. How many churches have we got like that? Big, fancy churches. Cathedrals to our own egos. But what are they inside? They're whitewashed sepulchers. And they're clean and bright and pretty on the outside, and there's death on the inside. Behold, the hire of the labor who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth and cries unto the Lord, which hath reaped and entered into the ears of the, of the Lord of the Sabbath. All of the things you've done, church, all of the laborers you have cheated, all of the wages you have withheld, all of the things you have done, all of the righteousness that you have eschewed in place of good religion, it's going to come back and it's going to be fire on you. You have lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just and he doth not resist you. Why? He can't. We got all these politicians saying, oh, I, I pray every day for, for this nation. I pray for the president. I'd like to know what you pray. <laughs> you have condemned and killed the just, and he does not resist you. You know, I found in the church today, you don't, you don't, get, in trouble for, you don't get in trouble for living carelessly or wantonly. You get in trouble for telling the truth. I was a part. Was I was raised as a part of a denomination. In fact, it was very high up in the uh, in the ranks of the denomination. And it dawned on me one day that this was a house of prostitution. It wasn't about God anymore. This was about programs. This was about politics. Who's going to seize power? And it dawned on me, and I said, I want no more. I can't stand this anymore. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, whom you have spoken, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for example, of suffering, affliction, and patience. Do what they've done. Look at, look at Jeremiah. Look at Hosea. Look at these prophets that have been abused. Look at Amos. Look at the prophets that have been abused. Now, if you, if you want to see how to live your life, there's, there's the example. When they hate you and they mistreat you, that's, that's part of the plan. That's, that's how it works. 
And if you're not hated among men, figure out why. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Ye have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not either by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain. This was about when Jeremiah withheld the rain. Three and a half years it didn't rain. Jeremiah prayed, he said, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed any sins, they shall forgive him. And he says, Now confess your faults one to another. But he says, Remember, remember, when they prayed for, when they prayed for drought to punish Israel, it happened. Why? Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And the church has lost that understanding. We have completely lost the understanding that prayer changes things. We have a nation in turmoil. We have a nation in, in chaos. We have a nation in violence. And we need to, frankly, we need to pray like never before because this isn't going to change on its own. We are facing the end of America as we know it. We have an election coming up. There's a man who's willing to stand in the gap. And by the way, I, I don't know whether Donald Trump's a Christian or not a Christian. I really don't. I've heard reports that he is and reports that he isn't. I don't know, but I do know this. I know that he is standing in the gap for America right now because whether he is a Christian or not, if you rule righteously, righteous results happen. And righteous results are happening. All over the world, the story never changes. If you want revival, there are qualifications. There are things you must do. And a common denominator in every one of those is prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. The great Welsh Revival, you remember the Welsh Revival? And by the way, the, the Welsh Revival was sparked by a young man about 23 years old. He was just a kid, this is a baby. He decided to save what little money he had from being a miner and a blacksmith and go to a, a college, a seminary. He got there and he was so on fire for God that he couldn't stand being in school anymore. He had to get out. He had to go preach someplace. And his family and his friends said, Hey, uh, Evan, you, you don't have any experience. You don't have a doctor behind your name or in front of your name. You haven't got a seminary degree. Who's going to come? Who's going to listen to you? Where's the money going to come from? He just laughed and said, Money will come from someplace. I'm not worried about it. He followed hard after God. See, that's what God's looking for. God is looking for someone who will follow hard after him. A.W. Tozer, following hard after God. Are you going to follow hard after God? That, that's, that's hard. It's hard because it's going to cost you something. It's always going to cost you something, every time. Prayer became sustenance to him. He said, I would rather pray than eat. They called him to supper one night. He says, listen, supper is great, but I would rather pray than eat. It is sustenance to me, more than food. About November 1st, 1904, he had almost decided that he was going to go preaching. But he still had that little bit of fear in his belly saying, you Am I really called for this? Does God really want me to preach? You know, I say that every Sabbath when I get up. Because I feel like I'm the least of these, my brethren. Why should I be here? Somebody else should be doing this. But he made the decision. He did it. And at the beginning, a little happened. Very little happened. He was looking around, he's got, he got a couple old guys with no teeth sitting there. That's about it. This is, this is not good. But he didn't quit. Because this wasn't about the crowds, and it wasn't about how big they were. It was about his commitment to doing what God had given him to do, and that was to preach the gospel. He couldn't do anything else. This is a guy that just, listen, I, let me tell you about this guy. 
from the time he was little, he knew he wanted a special experience with God. His whole life, that's what he wanted. He didn't pray for cars or houses or better jobs or a beautiful wife. He prayed for a relationship with God that would be so real that he felt it in his bones. And he followed hard after God. And one day he's praying and he gets it. He just gets it. He feels God inside. He feels God in every fiber of his being. Well, at the beginning, very little happened. He wasn't even really a theological student anymore. He had dropped out. He only had enough money to pay for a couple of weeks, which really isn't all that much. But if you look at most of the seminaries we have today, that's probably two weeks too many. But in a few days, as he persisted, a few more would come, and a few more would come, and a few more would come. And by the time it was done, 100,000 souls, 100,000 souls had come to the Messiah. In fact, the, the, the Welsh revival was so amazing that many of the constables, policemen, just went home. They had no business. The bars closed because no one was going. These were the days of people like Reese Howells, intercessor. A man of prayer. Reese Howells didn't know hardly anything except praying. Now he ended up building a huge school, a seminary, huge churches, but he didn't know anything but prayer. There's a common denominator in every revival I've ever studied, and I have studied probably a dozen or more. The Azusa Street Revival which is really the birth of the Pentecostal movement in America. It's a historic, a historic event because of who it involved. It took place in Los Angeles, California, and is the origin of the Pentecostal movement. It was led by William J. Seymour, an African-American preacher. He was the one-eyed, 34-year-old son of a former slave. Can you imagine that? In that day and age, 1904, the one-eyed son, a black man, son of a former slave, and yet God used him. Why? Because he was willing. He was willing. The fancy preachers in the area, by the way, didn't want him. Just like at the, 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 the first great awakening in the United States, we had George Whitfield. The fancy preachers didn't want him. He, he wasn't even allowed in their churches to preach, so he had to start preaching outside. Why? Because that's the only place he could go. But guess what? He wasn't limited to a church of 200 people. He would preach outdoors and 100,000 people would come. So God used what would seem an infirmity, he's not being allowed in the churches, as the blessing that birthed the first great awakening. From that, by the way, we got the United States of America. The second great awakening, with the great preachers of, that, of those days, ended slavery. And from that, from that William J. Seymour, the black, one-eyed son of a former slave, birthed the Pentecostal movement that swept across America. Christians were praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They wanted a deeper relationship with God. And here is the most humble man possibly you could find, this, this young man, this 34-year-old young man, the son of a slave, but God chose him to be his instrument. Why? Because he was willing. The Hebrides Revival. It wasn't sparked by big fancy preachers. Uh, Douglas Campbell was the preacher that, that, that came for the revival. Interestingly, if you listen to the sermons of Douglas Campbell, and they've got some on tape, this boy is droll. Douglas Campbell is a long way from a Billy Graham. I mean, this guy is kind of a snooze when you listen to him. But what happened? 
It wasn't about him. It was about two old ladies, one crippled, one blind. They couldn't get to church, thank goodness. So they went to their barn every night at 10 o'clock at night, and they prayed till 2 in the morning. And from 10 at night till 2 in the morning, they prayed, God send revival. God send revival. And then suddenly the preacher showed up, and they said, Preacher, are you right with God? They said, We don't think you are. You need to experience God, and you're not. So the preacher got right with God, and he started praying. And the interesting thing about the revival is this. Church would start at 5 or 6 at night and go till 10 at night. But from 10 o'clock at night when it let out, everybody would find a home they could go to because they could not stand to see the spirit quenched. we got to go someplace. we got to talk to God more. The houses would fill up. There'd be people outside. They'd have to open the windows so the people outside could hear. Sounds like a Trump rally, but it was smaller. It's houses. The people outside wanted to hear. They could not go home. Oftentimes, they would be out till 2, 3, 4 in the morning. But oftentimes till 2, from 10 until 2. Sound familiar? Two little ladies prayed every night from 10 until 2. And God moved. The Asbury Revival in 1970, Asbury College, Methodist, by the way. This was before the Methodist Church became today's Methodist Church, obviously. Bunch of college kids wanted more God. Men's dorm, which is the last place you'd ever think a revival was going to break out. I went to college and lived in a men's dorm. How a revival broke out, I'll never know. But, but they went. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed night after night after night after night after night. And one night, on a Monday night, they prayed. And one of the young men who had been leading the prayer said, Enough, we're done. God says it's happening tomorrow. He announced it's happening tomorrow. Go home, get a good night's sleep. God's going to move tomorrow. Now, I don't know if you've ever gotten a word from the Lord, but getting it from here out of here is really, really hard, particularly when you're predicting something like that. God's going to show up tomorrow. You're going to see him. You know what the boys are going to think of you? If God don't show, you better not show either. Because, But God showed up. One of the professors got up and, and made a confession. He said, I spent most of my life religious, but not Christian. I knew about God, but I didn't know God. But he said, I, sitting here, I, I know there's something that's missing in my life. And as he started making his confession, somebody would get up and say, I had that same thing. And they would make their confession, their testimony. Well, the president of the college got a call because there was a problem. It was the dean of, dean of Students, and he said, we've got a problem. So the, the college president said, oh my heavens, what's happened? He had just flown from Kentucky to Banff, Canada. So he's clear up in Planet Canada, and his administrator calls and said, we got a problem. He said, now this is a guy I trusted implicitly, and he's calling me saying he's got a problem. Remember, the 70s were the times when Presidents of colleges were being locked in their offices and buildings were being burned and sit-ins were happening. He says, oh my heavens, what's going on now? He got the message when he checked into the hotel. So he calls his guy. So what's wrong? He says, well, we got a problem. He says, well, what's the problem? He says, chapel. He said, chapel? What's the problem with chapel? He said, well, it's not over. He said, well, of course it's over. It's 7 o'clock at night. He said, no, sir, it's not over. It started this morning, and it's still going. He said, revival has come to the college. I said, I don't know what to do. Do we start classes? What do we do? So the president said, well, let them carry on. And the guy said, okay, we got another problem. We've got reporters calling, and they want to know what's happening, because students 
students are telling them what's going on. And the president said, don't let the press in. Even back then, they were crazy. He said, don't let the press in. He said, well, sir, I'll do what you want, but we have prayed about it, and we believe the press should come in. Well, the press came in. And the most remarkable thing happened. Many of them got saved there. The stories were glowing stories of what had happened. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous to us. When righteousness comes, revival comes. When prayer comes, revival comes. When we follow hard after God, revival comes. But the church doesn't follow hard after God. We follow hard after religion. My heavens, we've shut down churches across America and we said, well, for COVID-19, we can't open them back up. God said, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power. And churches are still not open. So you can go to a church without a mask and burn it, but if you're going to go to a church, you have to wear a mask because you get COVID-19. You see how perverse all of this has become? Psalm 118, all the nations compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Listen, folks, we've got enemies everywhere. We've got a hard left that wants to destroy America with everything they, they've got in them. Why? Because even our very Constitution, the three branches of government, were modeled after the Trinity, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the courts. The Father, the Presidency. The Congress, Messiah. Enacting laws, the laws of the land. He was the law. The Spirit, the courts, supposed to be the conscience of America. The executive. They saw that model in Yahweh and they said, this is what we need in government. We need that kind of wisdom, that kind of understanding. Thomas Jefferson, when he, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, didn't make a political argument. He made a spiritual argument. He said, he said, God endowed us with certain unalienable rights, and King, you have touched the endowment. That makes you a heretic, because you are not allowed to touch God's endowment. You're a heretic. So we're not breaking with you for political reasons. We're breaking with you for spiritual reasons. So we go back to the text. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Folks, we are coming late in history. You read, you read Revelation chapter 6. Where are we? Go through those horsemen. Go through the horsemen, I mean the, the, the beasts in Daniel chapter 7. Because of the time, I'm going to have to reserve that for a longer explanation later. But if you look at Daniel chapter 7's beasts and you look at Revelation chapter 6, they are the same description of the same thing. In Revelation chapter 6, I saw when the Lamb opened the seals and I heard as it was the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And what did he show John? He showed him the four horsemen. And when you go to Daniel chapter 7, what did he see? He saw four beasts. The first was like a lion and had an eagle's wings. And I beheld the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon its feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. How often have you seen England pictured with that lion, with the man's heart in it, and the face of a man? the symbol of, of, of England, and usually on the white horse. And by the way, those eagle's wings that were plucked, and those wings were put down in the wilderness, and they flew the who? The woman into the wilderness for protection for time, times, and a half a time. That's where those eagle's wings were. 
And guess what nation that was? That was America, because 90% of the gospel going out around the world has come from this country. And the woman, by the way, this is Revelation 12, 14. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Revelation 6, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown that was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Remember, he had the heart of a man, and the face of a man, and a bow, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Which was the first reasonably humane empire to launch out across the world? England. I believe that ride of that horse, that first beast, is description of the English, the British Empire. Daniel 7 again. And behold, another beast, a second like unto a bear, and it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth, uh, in the mouth of it between its teeth. And they said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now go to Revelation chapter 6 again. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there was, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto it that sat upon, that sat thereupon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So we got a red, we got a bear, a red bear, who raises up on one side, which side? The left side. And he has three teeth in its mouth. Three, I mean three ribs in its teeth. What three ribs? The three nations, the three empires, including the last remnants of the Christian Byzantine Empire were consumed by the Russian bear. And then on the other side we see the red horse, and he went forth conquering, and he went forth taking peace from the earth that they should kill one another. Well, what did we do with Russia? What, what happened? The whole world was at war. We had a Cold War that lasted 40 years, 50 years. Peace was taken from the earth, and the horse was red like the red empire of Russia. Daniel 7 again, And after this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth, excuse me, a third beast. And da Daniel 7, I'm sorry. And then I behold, and another likened to a leopard, which had on the back of it four wings and a fowl, of, excuse me, four wings of a fowl, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now go back to Revelation 6. When he opened the third seal, I saw there a third beast. Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the poor beast say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine, a black horse and a panther. Who had panther divisions? Panzer divisions with the black remnant in the, on the, the army of the SS. Nazis. I believe this is Nazi Germany, the right of the, the black horse. It says, hurt not the oil and the wine. Paris was never burned as, as Hitler had commanded. The oil and the wine of Paris, of France, weren't burned. A measure of wheat for a penny, Why, what happened? We had food rationing in the United States. We had food rationing all across Europe. Why? Because there were shortages. We had to feed the troops. And after this I saw in the night vision to behold a fourth beast, Daniel says, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had a great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. And it was diverse from all of the other beasts before it. And the fourth horseman of the apocalypse, it says, and there was a pale horse. But the word pale is not pale. The word pale is chloros. Chloros. Chloros is what? Chlorophyll. Green. They're a ride of the green horse. And it corresponds with Daniel's beast. And it was unlike any other beast, and it trampled everything under its feet. And it, it devoured everything in its path. The green horse, what? What do we think of when we think of green in modern warfare? Islam. The green flag of Islam. And it is diverse, a diverse beast unlike all the others. Why? Because it's in Indonesia, and it's in the Middle East, and it's in North America and South America. It's everywhere. 
It's not a beast like you would normally see. It's a beast that's diverse from everywhere. And it tramples underfoot. Ask ISIS about trampling underfoot. Islam has never spread except at the point of a sword. Always. So you see where we are. We are at the ride of the fourth horse of the apocalypse. That horse is already riding. And the fifth seal, the fifth seal has already been opened. We are there. This is, this is, if you will, the end of the end of time. The enemy is collecting his resources. He knows exactly what he's doing. Listen, that that whole nonsense in Seattle. Do you think that was just a spontaneous, spontaneous rebellion, where people just decided they were going to wake up angry one day and and riot? It was planned for years. The Sunshine Group is one of the groups that planned it. It is all being funded by something that very few people know anything about. It's called the Black Eagle Trust. During World War II, Yamashita, a general, buried a whole bunch of gold, probably in the neighborhood of $5 trillion worth of gold in the Philippines and other islands. Yamashita's gold has finally made it to television. I don't know if you've seen the, the program about the guys that are hunting for gold in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. They're looking for Yamashita's gold. Well, they aren't going to find much of it because General MacArthur and President Truman found a good share of it. Wow. And it has been set aside as an unregistered fund for president after president after president after president. And they have used that gold sometimes for good, sometimes for evil. Sometimes to defeat communism, sometimes to defeat America, depending upon the president. The last president, I believe, hid that treasure away. Every president since Truman has, that, has had access to it until this president. And that Black Eagle Trust is being used to foment all of the unrest and all of the unrighteousness you see here in this country and around the world. In fact, it's interesting because of that five trillion, between a quarter and a half a trillion dollars was put into securities. Nobody knew where they came from. They were just put into securities. They were incidentally being held in the Twin Towers and in the Pentagon. The Pentagon had a special agency looking into this quarter of a billion to half a, excuse me, quarter of a trillion to half a trillion dollars. And on 91101, the towers were taken down and the vault that held the documents was emptied. And the Naval Investigation Unit that was investigating the whole thing happened to be stationed in the Pentagon exactly where the plane hit and 49 of the 50 investigators died. Is there a tie-in? I don't know. I, I, I can't tell you. But I can tell you this. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, in politics, there are no coincidences. If it happened, you can bet it was planned that way. So it's time, folks, that, it's time, folks, that we take revival seriously. Listen, we, 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 we can't guarantee that the country is going to be revived. We can't guarantee revival for the state of Texas. We can't guarantee the revival for the city of Dallas or for whatever city you happen to be in. There's only one person you can promise can be in revival, and that's you. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. We are in the greatest darkness the world has seen. We are approaching a time that is going to be much, much darker yet. The Lord is calling out a people to be a remnant, to be the few. 
May I encourage you to pray. Listen, if you don't have one, get a, get a prayer journal. I know Brother James Patrick likes to use his, his Bible with the, the, the hands in the Bible so he can pray for the, the saints that he meets, and that's wonderful. But you need a journal. You need to plan to pray and plan what you're going to pray because we need to be serious about it. This is the time of darkest night. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. we got to get violent. This is no longer time for mealy mouth Christianity and cold religion. It's time to take the kingdom violently by force. In other words, following so hard after God that he can't refuse you. And that means commitment. That means that we're going to have to change who we are and what we are. The church is going to have to change. And we're going to have to realize that we are the church. We are Israel. We have a calling, a higher calling. It's time to declare war on darkness. That we might live in the light. In Yeshua's name. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. Now, Lord, we ask that you would give us courage and wisdom that you would rend heaven, Lord, and come down to us, to each of us. That we might be your people and walk out the destiny that you have given us before all eternity. In Yeshua's name, amen.